5 o'clock, it's the uh, Sheriff General License, and tonight they're doing a tour of the jail, so um, they're probably running late, so they'll sneak in here, but I think we'll go ahead and get started anyway. Uh, how about the agenda? Motion made and seconded. Motion made and seconded. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay. I, the minutes were on the website. They look very complete to me. I had a chance to look those over. Here. Motion to approve. Uh -huh. Motion to approve. Mm -hmm. I have a question. If there's something that's incorrect in the minutes, how do you guys deal with it? Point out to us. We'll correct it. <coughs> um, in the public comment section, on the last page, it said uh, John Dasso commented on wind energy development related safety issues and a need to consider the size of the project. Um, I have what he said verbatim here. And he's talking about a baseline of where to start from a property line based upon the evacuation hazard zone. So I feel that might be pertinent. And you left out um, Ambiro Cavazos from Strawn, who actually spoke on the size of the proposed project that I'm just paraphrasing. And Mr. Zier. Part of his comment was the purpose of ordinance is not to necessarily facilitate businesses but to protect the people that already live here so i don't know if you guys want that verbatim from the video or we don't need it verbatim but can you add a little bit to let's, let's go back to john i mean evacuate i mean safety was the safety the evacuation john i mean if i remember correctly that was kind of put out is evacuation is for safety purposes, correct? Is yeah, he said, I think we have a simple solution for a base. If the safety and evacuation zone for turbines is 500 meters, shouldn't we use that base from my property line as a non-participating landowner? Shouldn't that be the base? If we had to evacuate, that's the safety zone. I should be safe on my own property, correct? Doesn't that make sense that that be the basis for starting these discussions? <coughs> okay, can you paraphrase that? I mean, I think I'm just going to add some language as far as being an evacuation and safety zone. I mean, with the 500 meters. The 500 meters is important, and I'll bring up that information in a second. Yeah, 500 meters, that's fine. Any other corrections? Um, it was left out. There wasn't really any statements made by Ms. Fair in any of these minutes. And one thing that she did bring up, and she gave you a reference for was um, the safety instruction booklet for I think it's Vestas I'm not sure of the exact pronunciation or spelling of that as well as the rules of conduct for in and around turbines and they have a 500 meter evacuation zone so she gave you a specific reference that was left out of these minutes as well if you couldn't why don't we ask you to submit how you think what you think is left out, and we will present that at our next ag and zoning for approval. But you write that what you think we missed, get it to Chuck, and then we'll basically what's been done now is somebody has transcribed portions that we noticed were missing from our video. That's well, if you would give that to Chuck, have. then we will get it into the minutes as best we can. We'll make an addendum for yes. the minutes. Okay. okay. But you Is that okay? Get that presented to him. Okay. Next month, then we will, like Bill said, I think an addendum would be okay. the way to go. So, so then that would they be included. Is that a motion to approve what's here? Yes. Okay. Is there a second? With Mrs. Dassel, we couldn't prepare if she feels it's missing. Motion made and seconded. All those in favor of approving the minutes? Aye. Aye. Okay. Thanks for coming, Justin. We assume you were at the Okay, we have uh, Mike Ingalls here to do the ETSB report. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Oh, yeah. <coughs> yeah. So, well, really. Ritter, yeah, you're, 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 okay. I'll leave them behind. All 
right? Um, about 18 months ago or so, the county entered into an intergovernmental agreement to define the role of the Emergency Telephone System Board uh, in the county, primarily for budgetary purposes, uh, coming through this committee, because there's really never been a, a defined method, I guess. And whoever kind of drafted that put in their language that once a year, ETSB chairman would make a formal report at the March meeting. I'm going to figure out who that was, I'll spank you. <laughs> but here I am to fulfill the obligation that I insisted be in that agreement. Um, I'll just walk you through this very briefly, and if you have questions later after you've read it, I'll be glad to answer. Um, I just start out page one, talk about the board and what it is, and most of you members that have been on the county board for some time know. The board consists of 10 members by statute and ordinance. The sheriff is automatic. The other nine members are appointed by the county board chairman with the <coughs> advice and consent of the board. Uh, traditionally, there's usually been representatives from what is always referred to as the big three, Pontiac, Dwight, and Fairbury. And there's also a statutory requirement at least three have to be public service employees. Uh, when we kind of redid the agreement, Chairman Fannin felt it was important that we get some diversity, and he said his goal, as terms expire, uh, he would appoint three groups of people, basically three county board members, uh, three from the public safety, police chiefs, fire chiefs, EMS personnel, and three members at large. And there in front of you are the current members. He's really got where he needs to be, except um, we're short one county board member, and unless he changes his mind, his intent is to put a county board member on uh, this May when Joe Stock uh, <laughs> term is up. As far as employment, um, of course we have a, a director of communications, that's Randy Whitberg, and the 911 coordinator takes care of most of the clerical and technical stuff, Candy Bradshaw. There's 10 telecommunicators, dispatchers if you will, people that answer the phone and dispatch services. Uh, we're budgeted for 11, uh, so we have one vacancy. Uh, if you turn to page two, statistics, uh, there's four pages at the end of this that break down some of the statistics, and I won't get into a great deal of detail. <coughs> one thing that I was always amazed at, when we talk about in excess of 50,000 calls a year, one time some time ago before I got involved, I did that and I thought, those people are on the phone 24 hours a day and the calls are fairly short. You have to understand, law enforcement, 36,600 calls a year. When a policeman in Dwight, Fairbury, Pontiac, or a sheriff's deputy goes on duty, he calls in on the radio, he says, I'm on. When he goes on break, I'm on break, I'm off break, I'm on duty. Or I go for lunch, I'm back for So for every officer in Livingston County, there's eight or nine, ten communications a day. Those things are all logged and tracked. So those exceptional numbers are not people wanting 911 services. A lot of it's just routine communication. The uh, nice part about it, I'll get the capital project later, a lot of that goes away when we implement the new CAD system. As far as financials, I just summarized here. You county board members every month get the, the update on where we're at with our budget, and ETSB is included. Uh, the significant thing is last year, uh, we underspent budget about $145,000. Keep in mind, we were budgeted for 11 dispatchers. And it's pretty easy to come in under budget when you don't hire the people you budget for. So that's a, a share of that. Uh, the revenue, as a reminder, especially for newer board members, people in public. We get $1.50 per landline in Livingston County. That was approved 20-some years ago by the voters. We get about 56 cents per cell phone. And I say about because we don't know for sure. Cell phones, your cell phone bill, if your billing address in Livingston County is 75 cents surcharge. The state 
gets that money from the carriers, they administer it through one of several bureaucracies, namely the ICC. The time it gets to us, it's about 56 cents. Now when we say about, why don't we know? Because we don't know how many cell phones they're paying us for. We just get a check, usually a month or two late. There's no detail or anything else. This has been a sore point for a long time. We also get user fees from all of our agencies that we dispatch for. And when I say that, I remind people, because we're a little unique, we dispatch for every emergency service in Livingston County. Three police departments and the sheriff's department. Uh, 17, I think is the number, rural fire districts, Duffy's Ambulance, Cellcast, Southeast Livingston County Ambulance, and Dwight EMS. So it, most people think that's the way it is throughout the state of Illinois. It certainly is not. A lot of agencies still do their own dispatching. Some of LaSalle County was going to spend about a million and a half to consolidate three police departments, not including any of the fire services, not including the sheriff's department. Uh, the last governor allocated that money. I talked to the present governor yesterday. And don't think that's going to happen. He understands the need for consolidated. We're a model, quite frankly, for, for where EMS is going, or where ETSBs are going throughout the state. <clears throat> the fees for Livingston County and the three, the big three, the three municipalities, are based on a per capita basis. For all the rural fire districts and the EMS services, it's based on assessed evaluation because those formulas were developed 20-some years ago when the thing was first put together. Duffy's and Cellcast are unique because Duffy's doesn't have political boundaries. <coughs> Cellcast crosses political boundaries. Sometime back when the fees were determined, they said here's a fair amount, and it's just been that way ever <coughs> since. There are increases provided annually in the agreements that are tied to the CPI, which is not very much. Um, the most significant thing, and the thing I just wanted to briefly go over, especially for the new members, Livingston County Board, in the last budget cycle, did approve uh, setting aside $3 million in capital uh, for upgrading literally everything except the people inside the, the, the service. Uh, the software that's being used to track calls and report, and police reporting and jail administration and on and on, is actually several pieces of software. Several aren't even supported anymore. Um, they're old. If you're old enough to remember when computers ran DOS software, it's not, it's not a lot better than that. The radio system is UHF, which is a traditional law enforcement fire protection radio system. The problem, it has never given us 100% coverage throughout the county. Three years ago, the Fed government required to do what they call narrow banding, which was reduce the bandwidth 50%. It reduced the area of coverage. We have places in this county, and we've had some incidents, where an officer in a car cannot talk to anybody else. Uh, you get up around the white EMS, they transport a lot north to the hospitals in Kankakee and Morris. They get very far north in the white, and they're they're in outer space as far as uh, our dispatch center is concerned. We are in the process of moving to Starcom 21 radio system. It's the one used by the state police, by IDOT, by Department of Corrections, and a lot of other police agencies. It is the future of law enforcement radio in the state of Illinois. It will give us, they, Motorola actually owns the infrastructure, the towers if you will. You pay a monthly fee, like a cell phone fee, for use of that infrastructure. Um, obviously, it gets us out of the tower business someday when we can get rid of pages from the fire department. But more importantly, it allows us directly to communicate with state police, IDOT, when we have snowstorms on the highway and that sort of thing. Uh, right now, if we have an incident on I-55, if you dial 911, you're going to get our dispatch center if you're within Livingston County. Our people will say, can I have your name? What's the problem? Where are you at? 
they write all that down. <clears throat> they hang up. You're disconnected. They call the state police headquarters. Give them that information and they will dispatch. That goes away. Our people will be able to deal directly with the state or IDOT or uh, corrections. So a lot of technical advantages. We get almost complete coverage guaranteed. There's going to be a few dead spots, you know, in the building of a, or the basement of a building like Donnelly's and Dwight. We may have to put some repeaters in, but other than that, we're going to have uh, good radio communication among all of our law enforcement. Fire departments do have one Starcom radio. They were given that some years ago as part of the terrorism <coughs> task force. Some of our fire people went over to Woodford County, or not Woodford County, Washington after the tornado. That way they can communicate with other departments. They chose not to fully equip all of their equipment. Uh, and I'm not sure that I can make an argument that it's necessary. Fire and law enforcement are two different breeds when it comes to dispatch. You call, you have a fire, they send a fire truck. There's not a lot of communication in the meantime like with law enforcement. Uh, when they come back in, they log themselves out. Uh, eventually, it's going to happen, but hopefully we can find some grant money or something when that time comes. Uh, that kind of summarizes the, the movement from the radio side. The CAD side is really where some pretty amazing things happen. This software includes what we refer to as mapping. When a dispatcher, when you call, a map will come up and show the location. If it's a landline, it assumes it well. It knows it's your home. I've seen it happen. It'll, it'll put it right there in the center of the screen. If you're on a cell phone, due to triangulation, it shows the approximate location pretty accurately. Uh, that lets the dispatchers communicate that. Um, the software we have is not easily updated. In some cases it isn't, unfortunately. The new software is, is much more user friendly from the telecommunicator side. It's much more readily and accurately updated. It also has the advantage we can literally track vehicles. Fire departments, police, en route, we know where people are at, use the GPS technology. It's an integrated system which includes police reporting. We have three different systems among our law enforcement agencies. Uh, one, the vendor isn't even in business anymore. Uh, the other, it's, it's so antiquated, it's almost like sitting down and using a word process. The new reporting system is typical Windows functionality where it makes it much easier and much more accurate to do a report. Um, Officer makes a traffic stop, he doesn't call in and say, well, I got a guy that claims to be, and his driver's license says, Mike Engels, and do we have any wants, warrants, arrests, whatever that language is you see on TV? Uh, do we have any outstanding warrants? Does he have a criminal background? Is he known to be armed and dangerous? And on and on and on. Today, then the dispatcher uses leads, it's a state system, and inquires and into our local databases and they get back. In the meantime, you know, we've got an officer tied up and there's some safety issues. I've seen it happen in a demo. I don't know how many of you know it, but if you look on the back of your driver's license, you've got a barcode. Officer scans that. There was my picture, my name, my address, and there weren't any outstanding warrants for my arrest or criminal history. It's that fast and it's done at the scene. Jail administration, so booking, uh, tracking the population, the history, all of that stuff, fingerprints, photographs is all integrated today. It's about three or four different systems. Some work better than others. One doesn't work hardly at all. I won't tell you what it is. The point is, it's an integrated system that uses a single database. Uh, officer picks somebody up. If he doesn't have identification, descriptive data is very easy to find. We saw a demonstration, the one that always sticks in all of our mind. Um, let me see all the people that have a ta Harley Davidson tattoo on the lower right arm. And if past history was entered correctly, it literally brought up three guys with tattoos on Harley Davidson tattoos on their lower right arm. 
So from an investigative standpoint, it's like <coughs> anything we have. Um, you really have to see the demos to understand how fully functional it is. We're moving from the 20th century into the 21st, maybe the 19th of the 21st. Um, those two capital projects right now are just getting started. They're pulling wire out the dispatch center for the radio system. Uh, Supreme Radio out of Peoria is the vendor for the Motorola contracts with. Uh, within the next couple of months, they'll have the consoles in place, the radio system in place, test it and shook out, and start installing the cars. The CAD system, computer-aided dispatch, which is all this other amazing software I talked about, probably looking at September time frame. We think about after Labor Day and everybody says, why so long? Well, from a practical standpoint, we can only do one thing at a time. We've got to train people, we've got to shake things out. But the real reason is Spillman, the vendor, we got in line. They've, they've got enough clients that they're going to be installing, and there's about three or four clients ahead of us. And uh, that's the way they work. So it'll be late this year, and it may roll into next year before that's completely installed and everybody's trained. Um, I apologize, I didn't bring a lot of extra copies along. If anybody wants it, I can, you've all got my email address. I can email it to you. There are four sheets of statistics on the back. That's four of, I think it's 13 we look at every month, but it's a lot of it's looking at the same thing different ways. Uh, it's the number of calls that EMS, fire, and police uh, respond to every month. I would question you to be careful. Those numbers seem extremely high. Those are not all calls for emergency service. A lot of it's everything from officers I call punching in, punching out. Or, frankly, um, sometimes in the middle of the night, I'm just scared. I heard out, you know, uh, it's during a storm, you know, elderly people, one thing or another. And if our dispatchers have the time, they try to provide comfort uh, to those people. We don't encourage you to call and check on the weather. Uh, they don't, they'll only refer you to state police for highway information. Uh, but. Our people do a pretty good job. We've got some people who've been there since the very beginning, and we've got some fairly new people. Um, questions, comments? Questions, anybody in the audience, if you'd like. Yeah. We'll read your thanks, Mike, for your report. Yeah. And we'll General, we'll right. in. Quick. I'm just curious, you're talking about the database. Is that going to be stored on a server in Livingston County, or is it going to be stored on the cloud or somewhere? The database of the CAD software. You know. uh, initially, it will be on dual processors, redundancy. Uh -huh. uh, probably just from a good data security standpoint, I won't tell you where, but <laughs> <laughs> it's in what's the county. Yeah. <laughs> but we have talked about uh, investigating, and I've started those conversations. Um, I don't know if we would go to the cloud or not, and I know that scares a lot of people, although that is the future. Uh, we've talked about an off-site data center, and you can contract. There's, there's some in Bloomington, Peoria area, and that sort of thing. Uh, we've talked about that, not only for, for ETSB, we've talked about for the county, you know, to simplify it, pay somebody else to take care of the stuff that's costing us money. But, that's down the road, but for now, no, it'll be on dual processors, locally. Anything else? Anything? Just curious, how many dispatchers do you have on duty at one time? Uh, without, with a rare exception, we'll always have two, sometimes three. Uh, I guess that rare exception when two are scheduled, somebody calls in sick, there may be a lapse till we get somebody in. I'll be honest with you, there's only a short period of time, certain days, where one person couldn't handle it. But you just, you can't do that. Uh, the traffic's, I mean, you have to go out there and sit for a while to realize how much downtime, when I say downtime, they're not actively on the phone. They're doing other things. You know, 
typically it's two. Uh, there's some overlap. I mean, you figure it out. If you schedule 24 hours a day, seven days a week, it doesn't come out to equal numbers. We have what we call a power shift. The busy time uh, doesn't surprise anybody. It's probably 6 p.m. to midnight. We always say it's when the drugs are out, causing problems. But, uh, there's some. There's a period of time there from, I think Randy would tell you, from 2 a.m., 3 a.m. to about 7 a.m. It's really, it's, it's quiet. Anything else? Like I said, if you have questions, you or the committee or anybody, give me a call. Do you have information I thought we used to have information regarding uh, where the county officers were called, where they got their most calls. Because, like you In term of location? Towns. Yeah. Here, here you got a <coughs> fire. Yeah, well, have... those are fire districts. That's the number of calls they responded to, uh, which, obviously, if it's a white fire, it's in white. Uh, well, that's not always true either. Pontiac responds to a lot of sonic calls. Well, mutual aid is all over. I mean, that fire is Yeah, they, they, they do. There's mutual aid. Department. But Sodomon, there's a couple times a year planting and harvesting. <laughs> they just don't they get dispatched. Uh, but to answer your question, <clears throat> I don't I don't know, but I, I, I would be surprised if they couldn't. They, they used to do it. Well, if they used to do it, they could do it because the software hadn't changed yet. Yeah. You're talking about law enforcement responses. Law enforcement. I'll, uh, I'll ask. That's not something we see, you know, by township or by whatever. I'll ask. It would be interesting. Okay, thanks, Mike. You bet. Uh, Chuck, the, do you want to talk about the... Uh, Next item, item B on the agenda, the IEMA Potential Grant Review and Acknowledgement IEMA Accreditation. Are we going to take action for, on both of those separately? Or? No, we'll take action on the accreditation. Okay. The green issue is, um, I was approached by uh, Greg Mashad, who works for an environmental services company out of Springfield. He had worked on us when we did our all hazards mitigation plan for the county, which we completed a few years ago. And he had pointed out to me when he called me that the new grant that was coming out, the grant slide for the state that was coming out in regards to hazardous materials. Emergency protection, that's the HEMP, um, had some more leeway in it this year than it has in the past. It's generally been pretty confined as to how you can use it in the past. And he was basically selling himself to a degree, offering his services to do a commodity flow study for us, and then attached to the information I handed out to you is basically what his project description and what it would be in regards to another county, Whiteside County in this case, as to how they made it work. Um, it's basically, it is what it says it is. It's basically counting uh, trucks, trains, the pipelines, and, and doing an analysis as to the materials that are flowing through the county in regards to that. At the bottom of that, at the last page of his report, he kind of gives you a, a, type, uh, a timeline on this. This is a grant that would start, it's a fiscal grant, so it's October 1st of 2015. It goes into 2016. But the application for the grant's due in a couple of weeks or two days at this point in time. Um, in talking to him a little bit further today, his, his cost for the grant for him to do would be $5,000 for his cost. The county has a 20% match to the grant. That match would be made with, if you look at this, when he does the truck counts, he's training local staff, basically myself and Steve, under training 
to assist with the count and our 20% of the hour, our hours would go with that particular count. This does follow up when you'd have the possibility to do a phase two, you know, if the grant money's going to be there for doing a phase two. And then you have to take consideration as to, you know, what you're going to do with it and possibly look for more grants when it's included going beyond that. So um, this, this is not a normal grant that I get. I do get a, a grant from the state where my hours are already counted towards that. So it's kind of a, an issue that's out there. Um, I'm just bringing it up to you because Mr. Rashad brought it up to me. It is a grant that's out there. It's not a grant that we can really don't get because um, looking at the back end of it, once you get it done, you spend the money on the state side, what are you going to do with it on the other end? Um, we already know that you know, we have a lot of transportation that goes through the county with highways, trains, pipelines. Um, there's no doubt in my mind we have everything in the world that goes through this county. Uh, their biggest hazardous issue that is out there is transportation that goes through there, and we have a lot of good through there. So we know it's out there. I'm not real sure if you really need to know how much it is or how we go with it. So what you gonna do with that? Or what you do, what you get. So I'm not sitting here pushing for this. I'm just saying I was contacted this by this gentleman who was a contractor who probably wanted to get some money out of it and move forward. So I've tried to think of how we would go through the whole process to get it, and I'm not. We're not there yet. So I just think about that that kind of thing. I've seen a train coming from Dwight on south that had a bunch of tankers on it. You know, the figure of it. Um, that thing derailed, China, explode, fire, whatever. I don't know that. <laughs> hey, if we got that in the book, then it's the help them. What do you do? Yeah, you take away a lot of people to hurry as much as you can. I know we're back in the Dwight. Whatever it's 30 years ago, because it dropped a big picture. Uh, big spill of mm -hmm. uh, Knowing that those trucks are going to die, I don't know if it's going to be any good. We, we, already, we don't know they're going by, we know there's a lot going by. So. Okay. If, we, if we did the study, what would that, that would lead to perhaps a grant <coughs> to? It, it would lead to a second study. To make it more in depth, which then would lead to a grant, and then the grant would potentially lead into some more training for the local fire departments, etc. Cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, when you talked about the 20% match, are we talking about a thousand dollars? 20% of five thousand, or yes, probably. What's your thoughts? Was that just for the initial study? Judge? Just for the initial study. Yeah, so what about the second study? And what's that going to be? I don't have a clue. Okay. Thanks. I don't need it, so I have to. Take a pass on it this year? You think we're able to respond for public safety? Where we are now, Chuck. Will the grant make any difference? I don't know. I'm asking. Can we respond? We can respond to very well. Yeah. We've we got everything in place that we would need. Well, I think, you, I think you have to take a look at the bigger picture as to what Mike was just saying. And if, you know, when the fire departments are responding to go to Washington and stuff like that, I mean, they're talking about their, their maiden system where they have, a, you know, fire departments. You know, where they can contact almost any district in the state of Illinois. It goes in Wisconsin, Indiana, and Iowa. It's a very robust system where they can get a response that comes in here you know, fairly quickly. I think that kind of goes down up and down the line as far as it goes. So you know, your initial response, you know, if you're doing an evacuation, is how fast can you evacuate the white where they're going to go and how fast can you do it? Just because we are such a high traffic county, lots of different hazards. Materials, pipelines, rails, major. I, I want to be assured that we can handle it. Don't we have information on uh, somebody we, we can call that have that equipment and have that knowledge? Are there are people having that knowledge? That's where you call it out. I mean, you call the people of sister, yeah. Right. You use state, statewide resources. 
Texas, you know, we people. Is that okay? Yeah. Okay. All right. Just saving big money. In accreditation issues, we do have to be accredited every two years by the state of Illinois. And just, you know, we, we were accredited through 2016, so we'll keep on working on that. We can go from here on, too. So. Okay. We're down to C. Um, I'm not going to see. I guess an announced future hearing dates. So yeah, let's let's. Uh, we'll finally, fairly confirmed in on that. Where they, where they announced at the last meeting, where they'll be on March the tenth at six thirty at in February at Walton Center. I believe they're the following Monday on March the sixteenth. I believe we'll also be at Walton Center in February. Same time every time. Mm -hmm. Probably so. And I believe it's Wednesday, March the 18th. And then it'll be fine. Is that we'll also I do not know. These last three dates, I'm not going to have a site for you quite yet. And then the follow last two scheduled dates for the month are on March 30th, 31st. There are some conflicts with spring break week for that one weekend there. And then we may, you know, if we're getting close to the end there, we may take another day and like April first or something and kind of continue up to kind of figure that out. So, so the first date, the first date, March tenth is definitely in February. <coughs> I don't see how we can it, it, March sixteenth is gonna have to be in February. But after that the auditorium opens up at the high school a little bit and plays over with and some conflicts go by at that point in time. So maybe we're back to Pontiac for some of those dates at that point in time. Anything else regarding Pleasant Ridge? Is that from you? Okay. I just want to, you know, if there's any way we could end it up in March, nice. I think it'd be good because, I, you know, get into April, <coughs> maybe toward the end of April, we'll be farming. And that affects a lot of people. Mm -hmm. County is, so. Nice for us to be able to take it up at our April board meeting. Hopefully, and the ZBA is going to have to have it a while. Go mm ahead. -hmm. Uh, I would just like to express concern about the bankruptcy issues, and would really like to have the county retain a bankruptcy expert to talk about whether to look at our proposed decommissioning plan, not for the numbers, but for the actual enforceability of it and how how our citizens would be affected if there was an insolvency. And I think that it's a it's a difficult uh, I've been told at every conference that I've been to that it's it's a kind of a difficult issue. And I would uh, I think that the decommissioning is a very big um, very important backstop safety issue. Um, you, you're aware that we, we did uh, hire um, Patrick Engineer to study decommissioning for us. Their report's going to be ready Mar like March 10th or something, isn't it? Aren't they basically, though, looking at the, whether or not we have the right number attached to mm -hmm. uh, the amount of, you know, we would take to yeah, actually remove the step. What I want to know is, is that actually going to go into effect? Are we ever going to get to that point? Or does a bankruptcy court or a trustee in bankruptcy have options to avoid that? Mm -hmm. That's the bigger issue, whether we even get to that point. So that's why I'm saying it's nothing about the numbers. It's really just about how legally and financially, um, in terms of a bankruptcy proceeding, do all these, do these letters of credit and so on, are they actually going to protect this? Okay, I, I think that is, we can look into that. I mean, I think I we think get paid through, the county doesn't have to spend the money ourselves, right? We can we can have the applicant uh, do that, pay for that? <laughs> Up to... I suppose we can try that. But we can uh, first ask Jim Griffith what, uh, those questions, I think. And, 
get a response from him. Um, even if it didn't, it doesn't make any difference, we need to do that. So we can, that's something we can look into. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> okay. We have to the solid waste report. Not, I guess I was going to do, I mean, I'll eat. Okay. Yeah. You, you, guys, you guys want to be out here at 7 also. I mean, that can hold us back. Well, that's okay. Go ahead and get started. I mean, we're off the hill. Let's do that. Let's move ahead. Let's let's pay the bills and come back to that. Right. Chuck, have you got the, the bills? Yeah, yeah, right. You don't want to attach to that. that. Okay. $3,186 from November to January. Motion made and second to pay the bills. All in favor? All right. Aye. Aye. Okay. Now let's back up and uh, we we'll <laughs> You can see the clock from here, but <laughs> okay. Here we go. Let me totally back up here. Um, okay. Let me start to the back page you had in regards to this for the host fees. You had the host fee mop that came in. $291,000, for January, which we received in November. This is a, a small decrease, but that's because of the time of year as it came down. Uh, the amount is comparable to what we've gotten in the past during this time of year, so that was the amount of post fees that came in with the most recent check. I just did have a CPI built into the host fees, so this is, uh, I did go a few cents because of the CPI kicking in to, to raise the host fee for this particular year. So you did that. It starts in January? Yeah. Okay. And then moving back, you have the synopsis report that I have in front of you. Just to kind of go through this a little bit quickly and then more the details I can kind of cover for you also. Uh, basically, um, in order in which the reports came in, the first one was a report from CDC on um, the fourth quarter 2014 groundwater results, in which they indicated observed increases of dissolved lead, chloride, arsenic, nitrite, dissolved solids, pH, magnesium, phenols, and dissolved boron. And finally, the, the following one was to the groundwater notes that confirmed the increases. So these are the ones that were high in the third quarter and also in the fourth quarter, so it repeated itself. And these were in regards to the pH, the dissolved magnesium, the total dissolved solids, and the dissolved boron. So that. The next one on February 4th it was in regards to the decommissioning of the gas collector system because of some performance issues of pinch casing. And they're going to be replacing that collector and maybe doing it now. They are working out there currently on the gas system. February 5th, uh, they are again extending some review times with the EPA and some of their paperwork that comes through. Uh, February 10th, it had to deal with uh, another temporary decommissioning of several gas wells and some laterals and replacing a dual collector. I'll get back to that in a minute. And then the February 18th one had to do with the my gas migration. That was gas well XL 311 was reported high the last two months. There's none reported this month, so that issue is my way for this particular month. And then again at the bottom one, there's some decommissioned collectors. Uh, DD and Associates, which is our consultant on this, is reviewing the series of decommissions that's kind of going on and kind of figuring where they're at and kind of. Moving on in regards to that as those move forward. Uh, the back page, 
It has to do with the January 26th one, which is their monthly Clean Air Act report. Uh, they mentioned some decommissioning wells, which we previously mentioned to you, <coughs> and they had some malfunctioning events over the quarter um, on their flare systems to go along with that too, which they generally have every month. And then they did provide with me their, their tier two hazardous materials inventory, which is a quantity of fuel they have at the property uh, to operate for their equipment out there. So it's, if you have so many gallons, it goes above that. Under street or landfill, which is a closed landfill, um, this report is the methane was high in Krug X309, which is, comes up occasionally when you take a look at that. It's being closed with high slopes on this it has erosions issues with that during the winter so we'll check that this spring as far as erosion issues go with that and we'll come in regards to the erosion. <coughs> the problem in January where they had to dissolve magnesium, mm -hmm. dissolve solid and dissolve boron, I guess in the later reports it appears that's going away. Is that something did something well, to solve that or? No, I mean, it's just the nature of <coughs> it's, yeah. it's groundwater and groundwater moves. So when you test it on a particular day, you're going to have certain constituents in it. You can test it on another day, it's going to change. So, and then the ground, it does move. The water is flowing through there, it does move. So, so in the other CEC's reports, yeah. that test was done and it, nothing showed up. Because it doesn't say that <coughs> on February 5th, it doesn't show anything. On February 18th, it doesn't say anything. So does that does, mean that that? Well, you, now you, you get two different things. The two, the two top ones, are January 30th, are the groundwater monitoring wells, and, and, and the, the, the other one are gas those were tested or, 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 yeah, or gas collectors. No, they're tested after that. Okay. Give me a minute. I'll get to it here. All right. All right. Okay. Here's my quick landfill 101 there. And, and the stuff that you handed out to you just to kind of give you an idea as to what I, I gave you is just an overview. I just try to give you an idea as to that. Yeah, you know where Pontiac Landfill is. It's on both sides of the railroad. Go through there, Enbridge there, I 55 there, Route 23 there to kind of give you an idea. That's where all that stuff Well, the second page is just basically trying to explain to you a couple different things. I know it's hard to read. I have larger ones available, but we can just kind of go through it really quickly. This is railroad. If you look at this, this is railroad going down through the middle here. This is the farm field that you see as you go down 23. And this is cells A, B, and C. So when we're talking about cells A, B, and C, that's these three here. This is an elevation drawing. So you see the elevation so it comes up to the top and, and then that area there. This over here is parcel D. It's D1 through D6, D7, D3, D13. Those are the cells that go through there. I'll come back to the construction going on in that particular area there. So basically, when you look at this, at the present time, they're, they're completing dumping waste, placing waste in this area right in here on cell C. They'll be done with that soon. And they'll be moving their completed cell 7. The quarter of cell D8 was constructed and is not a permit to go in there. To be moving in there. The part you see above ground over there is these, these D1 to D6 moving that direction through there. They do have 15 feet left on there, so they'll come back and they'll dump waste coming across that. Um, they'll try to do that when they're in non windy period this time of the year so the trash doesn't blow. And they're up on top, and the, the, the mound is when they get in that generally are there. So, like, is D7 down low, or is that high up? In D7 is about halfway up. Okay. Okay. What's What's real low and what's high? Hang on. Okay. Go to the next page here. <laughs> the next two pages divide up each side so you can read the numbers a little bit better as far as what they go. Um, so as you're looking at this, the ones that have a lot of the lines going up to it, those are the high points that go through there. If you look down to D7, you see a series of lines going up to that, so that's high also. Then the rest is low. So the D8 and D9, is the barrel area, so when you look at it, that's going to be a hole in the ground. And then going north of there is going to be the farm ground as you move through that, going through that area through there. One of the main parts of this that, that, that I have in front of you is if you look at all the black dots on here and all the lines that are going through that, this is the, the gas collection system that's out there. So each one of those is a gas well, and those are all the mains that are connecting it to bring it through to make that happen. 
look real close on this. The first one I gave you, you see a dark black line that connects the two, going through that area there. That's the gas line that feeds through into the main system, brings into the main, and then it goes in. It burns off on the flares, it goes through the gas energy plant. I keep going through the gas energy plant, but it brings into the way they're disposing the gas in that particular area through there. When, when they have those gas wells, when do they put those in? Do they pound them in after all the garbage is there, or do they do it as they're going up and dumping garbage? Uh, they generally put them in after about a year, after the first garbage is in there about a year. And then do they have to pound them? Yeah, you know, they drill They them. auger it they, in? You know, they put a well rigging up there and put it in like a well rig. Okay. And they bore a hole? Bore a hole. And it's in a casing then? It's PVC and it's got holes on the end of it, so it's a high-end PVC. And then the, the gas goes through the PVC and it's puts on a, there's a pump on a vacuum, the vacuum is on a top, so it's in a closed system. And then it goes into a main. by a line into a main. And then into a bigger main. Oh. And then over to the bigger gas system. Okay. And so then sometimes we'll have a leak in mm -hmm. one of those lines. Mm -hmm. Right? Right. Okay. And then they've got to go in and repair it. Right. And how deep are those lines in the well? Do they go down to the ground level? They vary. None of them go down to the ground level. They're well, I, I take that back. If, yeah. if you go to the next one you have here, um, some of these in the middle, which you can't read on here, but the dual well that I mentioned before, what well, was the old fill area, which was put there before it became a large the local landfill. It didn't have a, a plastic liner underneath it, so it's just a soil one in that. Okay. So when they came in here, they put in a, a dual well, which takes out the leachate, like a straw, and also takes out the gas at the same time. So those are the ones that they have issues with. I, know, issue, all, I mean, they have issues with a lot of them. But, and the issues they have with them, like the ones they're replacing on sea where they're at now, is because they're, they put them in two or three years ago, but now they're looking around them. So they hit them, put more garbage on them, drive equipment over, so they yeah. pitch them and everything else, and then in the way it shifts. So, you so when you talk about paint goes down there, it's going to crush these things as they roll. So I'll pitch when them you talk about doing well, what that means is taking out leachate and it's yeah. also take extracting the gas right. from the main line. Right. And leachate is any water that touches garbage is leachate, so it has, yeah. to, be, it has to be taken care of. So. Okay. Thank you. Of time. Uh, on the back side, there's ABC coming across here. Uh, cell A is clear to the east, and B is in the middle, and C is over here. Um, when these are constructed, there's basically a, a four foot compacted clay liner, then they have a 60 mil uh, synthetic liner. You get pictures of that I think, you know, several months ago. That's all welded together and tested. It has a, it's confirmed that it's there. And then they put in a, a sand, or which is kind of a gravel zone, and then a, a geotextile on top of that, then the garbage. Um, the leachate goes down into that sand zone. It's all slanted, so it goes down to a pump at the end of it. So all the leachate goes into a pump. Those, all those are on the perimeter, and it goes over to a leachate tank that sits at the back of the entire south end. If you see a ground tank, if you go down 23 or ground tank, that is the round, that's the leachate tank where all the leachate ends up in that particular area there. At the present time, the leachate is generally disposed of at the Pontiac Sewage Treatment Facility. It is trucked there and it goes there to do that. They do have a permit in which they can actually recirculate the leachate onto the open area. And they do that a little bit, but not as much as they, they, ex they experimented with it and kind of backed off that a little bit. And they're also working on trying to get a, a main that will go from the leachate tank here, cut diagonally across the farm field into the city sewer that ran out to there too. So come directly into the city sewer system to do that. Did the city sewer system, did they get on the other side of I-55? Yes. yes, they did. How far? They're up to, they're just probably about 300 feet south of the magazine. somehow. You go down there, you see a manhole, it's right there. Large manhole, pump there. Um,
I had it, but I'm going to show you at the same time. But there's a series of wells around each edge of this, and the, there's clusters of water wells. The water wells are not on it, they're outside the footprint of it to monitor it. And they're clusters of three because the water levels in three different levels. For most part, the underground water for, for this landfill flows this direction towards the southwest, and there's a creek in through here that runs through here. So these are the wells that we, we look at. All, all the wells are tested, but these are the ones that we look at through there um, a lot. Um, so that's, that's what you see when they test groundwaters, groundwater wells. And I'll do it in another meeting. I'm not going to do it tonight. But, but the, these are the, the chemists you're seeing here are all natural occurring chemicals in here. They have a list that they have to test on that are all tolines and man made chemicals. Those are the ones that you take a real serious look and see if those pop up, and those are a larger concern more than anything else. The landfill has to set a parameter when they put a well in, they do testing of that well for the first year. So they take the first four quarters, they take an average of what they think that parameter is going to be for magnesium or whatever, they set it there. So that's the, that's the parameter they have to meet. If they miss that parameter, and they have to report they missed it, and then they either see the well come down, it goes up, and then if it goes up, they may say, okay, well, this is a bad parameter, so they have to be paid to raise it, or else they correct it in some fashion or way. So, and I have a lot of reports I can show you with that and how it goes up and down and when I need that tonight. So, so after the first year, it's a baseline. It's a baseline, and that's reported what they use, and it's a, a large series of loans that they go through with that. And just a, a quick issue is one of the back one is to almost in the time. Uh, this is the area photo of the street area landfill. This is Route 23 as it comes into South Streeter. This is the overpass coming over there. You just take the frontage road before you get there, it's a concrete road. You see the landfills right in here where the actual landfill is. This is the Vermilion River, so it does sit right on the Vermilion River. This is a closed landfill. This was the borrow area in here where the initial material that go in there. They sought permission to bring it expanded over here, but due to the high cost of operating this landfill, they decided to close the landfill since the public ended up on all, all, all of them. They own the one in Pontiac. They own one in Morris, they own one in Ottawa, uh, they own one in McLean County, they own one in McLean County be closing shortly, one in Morris or Ottawa is closing shortly too. But they had a lot of landfill capacity in the area and since this had a high cost to it, they decided not to develop that any further. When this, this was developed, you know, when they did the mining at the turn of the century and before in the 1800s, they had mine coming in off the banks, they had to shake, they mine below the coal veins that went through there, so this had to actually go below the coal, and then they brought the landfill up from there as far as the line is concerned in regards to that. And then this is just a, what this was trying to depict to you is just the outline of it. It is closed, and you take a look at it on a frequent basis as far as where it's at, and then since it's got such a steep slope to it, it's got erosion issues, it's got poor soil, and they, things grow on it, so we kind of take a hard look at that in regards to that. So. Uh, one time they said we're going to do things to try and improve that erosion problem. Unless you're over by the building on the, you know, the north west yeah. side. The bu actually, the building, actually, this side, they did come back in and regrade that and reseed it again. And this building is, is, is a lot better over here. It's more the northeast side where they have a lot of the water flow. There's a downshoot here, 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 and here. There's four downshoots to drain off the top. This downshoot over here, a lot of the water goes there and it goes right down. It's, it's heading towards this retention pond. And then the, the drainage ditch along the edge of it, and then the, the culverts to get water over there is over there. And this is the problem area now. As far as erosion? All right. Um, if any of you, you know, you do offer tours of it, so you, Meeting numbers. If any of you like to ever have a nice tour of the facilities, I you know we need that. We can we can arrange that at any, at any point in time. If you want to take a tour of one or both the facilities, just let us know and we can arrange to make that happen. So they don't feed us lunch after that. Actually, they have, they, have, they used to have a, the, the annual open house each August. 
Uh, they've cut that back down to being every two or three years since it started conflicting with the kids being in school it's late in August. And they do too much of those. It's so. right yeah. up on the hill. I brought a lot of reports and everything to show you more, but I'm not going to do that tonight. So. Good. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I didn't mean to, to shut you off. If there's anything else you wanted. No, nah, fine. Okay. <laughs> That's my quick question. Okay, <laughs> thanks. Uh, it's questions about uh, landfill issues? Go ahead. I have a quick question. It's not really the landfill issue, but I wanted to ask Chuck before he is done. Um, when's the last time the Smith Douglas site was was uh, reviewed? Because that berm there is very, very critical, and it's under the state's responsible for it, aren't they? But do yeah, we know I, if they're really keeping up with that? You know, they were, I mean, I was on the property two years ago now, be two years in the spring. Um, when they made an agreement to pump down those ponds, there was a fresh pond and kill pond, or whatever they call it, ponds in there. Um, but they got names for them. Um, Chuck, would you clarify for everybody what you're talking about? Okay. Smith Douglas is, is, a, is an old, it was originally a brickyard over in the streeter area. It is on the eastern edge of what is the developed area of South Streeter, just south of the developed area of Streeter. It was originally a brick plant. They, they took clay out of that and made brick out of it originally is what it was. And they had the ponds there um, that were part of them digging out from the brick. As time went by, it was developed into a, a fertilizer plant of which um, had a series of owners that went, Borden was one of them, and had a series of owners that made fertilizer there. The byproduct of the fertilizer was, was gypsum. So if you go over there, you can see a, some 20 foot high mounds of gypsum. And nothing grows well on gypsum. So it's, you can actually see the gypsum that's there. Um, the last owner of the property went bankrupt. I believe in Massachusetts had a, it was an East, East Coast bankruptcy judge took care of it. He basically abandoned the property as it was. Um, the EPA came in and sealed the site because of some hazardous areas that were in regards to it. Uh, one of them has to do, fiber, there was fiberglass on one of the buildings, so it was fiberglass, frayed fiberglass. The, they created their own landfill on the property, so there's actually a landfill on the property, and, and they just sealed the property because of the gypsum, because of some US EPA regulations to go with the gypsum. And there's some studies done as to how you could do that. The gypsum could, <coughs> it is, if you took it off slowly, it'd take about 20 to 30 years. It could be, you put down at agricultural rates, but you'd have to have people agree to do that. So you'd go real slow to do that and to transport it. It could be shipped back to its originator, which would be in Florida, I believe, which is a lot of money that's beyond that. But anyway. It ended up being an orphan property, so like nobody owns the deed to it, except and the EPA's got sealed, so they don't want anybody on the property. So it creates a lot of problems. Um, what Carolyn was talking about is there is a, a creek that goes through the property, which goes into the Vermilion River right at the end of, of the, of the pro property there. And then part of it, from the pulling out of the clay to build the bricks, and they end up being the ponds for part of the fertilizer operation. One of them butts up against the creek where there is a berm wall that separates the one pond <coughs> from the creek. There was some agreements made a number of years ago where some of the prior owners actually came in and they did some annual treatments to the water that was in the ponds. And then they also made an agreement to pump down the water off of the one pond bordering that. So basically they take the water, they pump it from the pond, put it up the top of the gypsum pile, and it would basically percolate, circulate back down, come around. And they've been, they had been doing that for the last two years ago, and they still be doing that. So just by taking that water down out of that, that reduced the pressure off that wall. So you know, I think that was greatly taken care of. I think that was, they could, once they got the water out of there, I think that helped a whole lot. And they did treat the water, they made a huge difference too, so. Did it actually seal, did the water from that pond actually go into the, the stream, into the 
that creek, but that, that was a story I heard, um, it's about, um, I'll say 20 years ago, that it, it actually went into the creek. I don't know the history of it. Okay. I suppose if it flooded and overflowed, I guess there's a possibility, but I don't know. It's ugly. It's better yeah. one. The whole, pro the whole property looks like a waste. That basic answer question, or, but but as far as that, is, the last I heard is the state EPA had it, and there was a Sue Bay had it. She retired. They took it off to somebody else, and kind of got lost in the EPA administrative, whatever you want to say. <laughs> I thought uh, it might make sense to just if you would call the county and find out when's the last time, just to make sure they haven't forgotten about it, because when they did that. LCEA asked them to re-score the site to see if it would be bad enough to be Superfund because if it was bad enough to be Superfund then there'd be a way to get money to fix it. But unfortunately it didn't quite, it's not quite that bad because I mean fortunately or not unfortunately, I don't know, you can look at it both ways, um, but it doesn't score high enough yet it is still a danger to the uh, stream there. And basically what they concluded was as long as that berm stays in place, that, but it needs to be maintained. It's like any other berm. It needs to be looked at and rainfall and other things can affect it. So that's what they told me the last time that I talked to the EPA about it. And that's, a long, that's quite a while ago. And Borden was willing to do that work. Um, they didn't Nobody wants to have to clean it up, of course, because rock's really heavy and it's really expensive to truck it out of there. So, Borden's compromise was, we'll keep the berm going. But I don't know when the last time was that anybody looked at it. That's all. I'm just, just something that maybe is kind of under the radar now. But I hope somebody's looking at it. Okay, I follow. We I should can, not I, have I, I, can, I can look at it again, because I kind of know where I know where it's at. So I've been on a lot, so I know it's at. They said something like, if it did break, it would like kill fish for like ten miles or something. I, that, well, I'm not aware of that ever happening. That but, was the study. But, the, but that, that pond is that pond it, is cleaned up a lot. I mean, that, that's, yeah, okay. they they treated that and they cleaned that up. It's not that pond's. It's got wildlife and everything in it. It's not. The pond is a lot better. It's good. Murky brown instead of green. <laughs> <laughs> Murky brown is okay as long as yeah. it's not toxic. So they, they about the biggest human health hazard from that site was actually from people trespassing and four wheeling on the pile of gypsum. Partying and everything else. Mm -hmm. There are probably <laughs> snowmobilers there today. <laughs> they tried to put up signs for people shot them up. So. Any, any other issues to come before the committee? Anybody got anything here? We're down to public comment. I hope we could limit it here tonight. But uh, and I don't think we'll take anything about Pleasant Ridge. We've got six more nights of hearings to go on that. Anything else? Anybody? Justin. Motion, oh, Justin. Oh, Motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Awesome. Second, Thank Justin. All those in favor? All right. Thank you. Thank you all for coming.